Welcome to the Rant Live. Hey, welcome everybody to the Rant Live. It is uh, Tuesday, August 17th. And um, if you're still paying attention to the big league team, Ooh. I feel for you. I feel Ooh. I feel for you. You you like pain? Mm. You like bad things. Evan is let me mm. like it it's confounding how bad the team is. And, you know, I was watching the game last night and I was thinking, you know, they use all the analytics and everything like these advanced analytics to uh, that's what Theo kind of started back in the day with Boston and he brought over to the Cubs and it's very successful, right? I mean, when you get it right and you get the right players in that complement each other in an analytical way, you can win a lot of games, but I'm thinking, have they reverse engineered this? Have they, did they purposely, now follow me here. Did they purposely take the analytics and try to figure out if how they could make the worst team so that it complements each other? You know what I'm saying? So the players as poorly as possible. <laughs> they've, they've ensured because, that they will never win again. <laughs> Ser- uh, seriously, I think that's what happened. And I think Jed Hoyer is proving himself to be an analytical genius. Well, uh you Prove know, me it wrong. Is, no, I mean, I don't know that I really can because they're This is from the moment, like, and and there is still potential that on paper, this will be the worst Cubs team of all time at over the whole season. They've only lost. There's, there's what, three other occasions four, three on which they've lost a hundred games. One of which came during the rebuild. Um, The others were 62 and 66. So I think their record is, these are 103 or 104 losses. This team could get there. Okay. This team could even with the players that they traded away, even having them until July 30th, this team could still surpass 100. I I don't think 100 losses is even a stretch at this point. I mean, I think that's almost a given if we look at the way they've been playing. And go back Yeah, and you're talking about this is a team that had a 19 and 8 record yeah. in May. And that, that's like and and as of <laughs> as of June 24th, when they no hit, when they had the combined no hitter against the Dodgers, they were on pace for 94 wins. 94 wins on June 24th. It's about the midway point of the season. And now we're sitting here talking like like the, the turnaround. It, and but you know it's it's a, but if you take out that month, and I, I looked at this too. If you take out the two losing streaks, the 11 and 12 game, which obviously you can't, but even if you take those out, their remaining winning percentage would still only be third in the NL Central. So you could take out 23 losses and they're still behind the Reds. Like that's how bad. And but but go back to it and remember what we talked about and what everybody, not not you and I, we, but like we, the royal we, with trading you Darvish and then going with a, a rotation that was based on a bunch of soft tossers with at the time Trevor Williams and Jake Arietta, uh, neither of whom are with the team anymore, of course. And then Hendricks and Davies, there was a, th- you know, Hey, did they, did they find something and for about a minute and a half? It actually was working out fairly well, uh, but very clearly. And then you look at, and, and obviously when you trade off, when you have a bad pitching staff and then you trade away the three best relievers on that staff, you are clearly going to have other problems and man, it has just got like, they, they had a very, very thin margin for error to start with. And then they've gotten rid of all of the players who created what little margin they had. So now there's zero. Now they've got to be perfect or lucky just to win a game, let alone string together any wins. And it is well, wow. over the over the 12 game losing streak, they've scored 43 runs, which is 3.58 runs per game. Uh the MLB average is 4.51. So they're there's just it's not terrible offensively, but defensively, they've allowed 101 runs. Woo. Oof. That's a uh, man. That's a uh, it's, it's 8.41 runs per game. I mean, and they are regularly getting you know these double digit numbers hung on them, and it's just I mean, like even the Marlins looked like a World Series contender against <laughs> this team, and so that's why where, where I say. I, I really do believe that that Jed Hoyer has done his best to analytically put together the worst team you could possibly put together. Can you imagine this team on the field for a full season? 
Oh, dude, the 2012 team that lost 100 games, that team would beat the hell out of this team right now. They'd that sweep 2012 them. team was better. A lot, like a lot better. Like this, I I am not exaggerating when I say I think right now the Cubs are the worst team in baseball. Their record oh, for does sure. not reflect it because yeah. of that. May, Between them and the D backs. Yeah. Do they play the D backs again? No. They've already played them uh, twice in the second half. They played them. They played. That's that's what got them started. They won two out of three against them uh, right out of the break. So they, they 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 had that eleven game losing streak. Then they went two and two to close the first half. Then they opened with two wins. It, you know what's done was done uh, by that point already. But it, it I mean they're they're worse. I, they're right up there with the Diamondbacks. I think they're you know they're worse than the Orioles. You know I almost wore my Orioles hat uh, just to to kind of you know like uh, set an example for what the Cubs are trying to be. Uh, the the problem there is, you know, those teams were were kind of. I mean, the the Orioles have been rebuilding, quote unquote. They they don't know what the hell they're doing. Clearly, there is a lack of direction there because they've been really bad for a while now. Yeah, and they they're have. not making any progress. And the D backs went out. They you know they signed Madison Bumgarner. They made some moves and like eh, they had more, which was a curious move at the time. Anyway, I'm like, you guys are signing this dude for how much? But anyway, um, it's it, they're just they're. The Cubs are awful. I mean, they 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 simply are really really terrible. I I do believe the number five pick is is almost a foregone conclusion. I would be shocked with as bad as they are right now if they don't. Ca- I mean, I don't think they're getting a four. Uh, there's no way they catch the Pirates because the Pirates were just so bad uh, for so long early. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. they they well, play we- the Pirates again. Well, but they, it's like a nine or ten game gap still. So I mean, they, they, even if the Cubs, even if the Cubs went zero for the rest of the season, the Pirates just have to win. You know, the Pirates would have to lose. Or, I mean, win less than ten games out of their last, you know, thirty some. So I, the I Cubs don't, play I don't the Pirates seven more times. Well, so I suppose it is possible. They, like every team the Cubs play from here on out, honestly, is either a contender, like in the playoffs, or a contender. Or they're one of the teams battling for that those those top five to seven spots, and so if they keep playing like this, they will easily play themselves into the fifth because they still have to play Kansas City. They've still got to play the Twins. Uh, they still do. They still play the Rockies again. Um, they've got the they Nationals. Not play the Rockies. I think no, they don't play the Nationals nope. again, right? Uh, um, no, they do. They they play the Rockies on the upcoming homestand. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. So they're they're but the Rockies suck on the road, so that that might be something. Uh, but I mean, but the Cubs still need to play. St. Louis is kind of in that middling spot, so they're like the one of them. But the Cubs still have to play the Pirates. They've got to play Milwaukee again. They've got to play the Phillies. Uh, they got to play the Giants again. So there are, and and that's with Chris Bryant coming back to town, who's and he's been mashing and talking about how happy he is out there. It's just there's there's just so many things, and and as much as I know, there are still people. There's a lot of people out there actually that are like. I don't, I'm not mad about this. It had to happen, whatever, which first of all is wrong. It didn't have to happen, right? Because there were multiple little decisions that could have been made along the way that could have prevented a rebuild like this, this kind of tank going a hundred losses never had to happen. No. should not have happened. No. And that's, that's what this is a, a distinct drop off and turn around. And we don't know about the turnaround. So you could say, Oh, this is what, but, a rebuild is not guaranteed and success is not guaranteed. So maybe we look back on this in three years and say, okay, Hey, it worked out kind of like what's happened with the Red Sox a couple times. But to say that it had to happen this way is foolish because that's saying, well, all the decisions they made prior to this were fine and built toward it. No, they, they made a lot of, in, they didn't trade guys when they should have, when their value was high, Ian Happ and Kyle Schwarber and so forth. If you're going to end up without them anyway, uh, they, they made some very poor signings, as far as it was like, look at Tyler Chatwood or some of these other ancillary uh, moves that they kind of got these guys in there as as role players. Because people want to blame this on the core. It's not the fault of the best players on the team that they didn't win. It's the fault of the front office for not surrounding the best players with the right complementary pieces that could lead to something better. Um, well, and that's and, that's the thing that kind of gets me is it, w- when you start looking at when you model out anything, right? Like I'm a finance guy, so I model stuff. When, when you model things, you look at multiple scenarios, okay? And so it, some scenarios are, you know, really good. Some scenarios are bad. And so you, you, you want to make sure that you're 
you know, being very inclusive in the number of scenarios that you're looking at. So you can understand, hey, this is what happens if this scenario takes place or this person performs like this or that happens or, you know, whatever. And it feels like the Cubs never really ran multiple scenarios. It's like the scenario they were always running was the 2016, 2015, 2016 playbook, assuming that the players that they had would all continue to perform at the levels that they had. And all they needed to do was add these small little Daniel Descalso pieces and voila, you'd continue to win. And, and so it's just, it's, it's, I'd love to see their assumptions when they were running their analyses, just to understand like, how do you get here? Because when you talk about all the decisions that they made up to this point, yeah, they're, they make you scratch your head. They don't make a lot of sense especially when you step back and look at the whole situation, which is where we are now, but it's like they had to be running multiple scenarios. And it's like, clearly whatever that analysis was that started, you know, back in 2013, 14, 15, that got them here. They should probably throw that away and figure out a different way to look at things going forward. And maybe they will, maybe that was the Theo thing. Uh, Maybe that's where the shortfall was. We know Theo hasn't had a, any success in repeating as World Series champion. Uh, and so maybe that's kind of, you know, on him. So I guess we'll see. But but right now, really, it's about keeping perspective, right? I mean, the minor leagues, the Cubs have a very, very exciting minor league uh, prospect list, if you want to say that. Brendan Davis, uh, Reginald Presadio, who they got in the U Darvish trade, is the number two prospect. Uh, and he hasn't even seen any minor league time. I think he's down in Arizona with uh, Christian Hernandez um, in the rookie league. And uh, but but that's really where the future lies is in the prospects is in the minor leagues right now. And so the cool thing is is that Marquis actually finally figured something out, and they're starting to show minor league games. So that's really cool. Yeah, from more than you know, the first couple of them were like Iowa Cubs games. And then they had, you know, I think they've had a Myrtle Beach Pelicans game on there. Um, I know they're showing they're show all four affiliates are going to get some airtime here over the remainder of the season, which, you know, it's kind of like, oh, that's weird. I feel like we've been talking about that for a while. Like, if you're going to give me a shitty product as your as your staple, at least come back and, and get, you know, and, and, and they've done that to you. You remember when Marquis first launched right during spring training last year and then the <laughs> season got canceled. And then all they did was basically they had a Carrie Wood documentary. And then like an Ernie Banks one. And so all day long would be like one of those two. Um, and then, you know, there'd be like an old game that they'd show. And and I still find it hilarious that they'll advertise Sammy Sosa on some of the things like uh, running down the greatest Cubs moments. I'm like, you won't even invite this guy back for Cubs convention. You act like he doesn't <laughs> exist. And as always, you're using him to pimp your product. Uh, just like he's the one who who sent prices skyrocketing back in the 90s, uh, ticket prices. Speaking of which, we, we don't need to get into this too much, but uh, the annual charade of the season ticket holder waiting list and and uh, getting, oh, you're, you're, there, come <laughs> yeah. up. you're like, what are you talking about? I was number 38,000. Like, again, that's a charade. It always has been. It's not real. But uh, I know a lot of people are starting to get that now, which I'm like, huh, there's, <laughs> there's two months left in the season and they're already trying to mine through the season ticket holder waiting list at this point. What does that tell you? So between that and the Field of Dreams game um, that, the, that the Cubs got announced for, I wonder, do do some of those things from a business perspective, because that's a lot. what, what a, a lot of this comes down to, does as much as we know Tom Ricketts does not like to spend additional money. He's literally said, you know, he's talking about the, the luxury tax as a deadweight cost, a deadweight loss. He, we know he doesn't want to spend more than what is necessary i'll put it that way what i wonder is does that pressure because when we're talking about season tickets and we're talking about people bailing on that you're also talking about it not being as attractive a product for corporate sponsors and for people renting suites like hey it's exciting on the south side of town and guess what it's a hell of a lot cheaper to go get a suite and to to entertain clients down there and and probably a better experience so do things like that and and not wanting to be embarrassed on a national stage and and pressure maybe from MLB, I don't know. Does that push the Cubs to to kind of have to at least try? Does that force you know? And and there's a ton of money that we know is out there in the payroll. Does that allow Jed Hoyer a bigger budget? I guess that's it remains to be seen. 
but you do kind of wonder if those things will will jumpstart that a little bit, uh, if nothing else will. Who knows? Hard to say on that one, but yeah, it's it's not a good product. Obviously, it's not. Um, it's and and the the tone deafness of the Ricketts family, where they are patting themselves on the back. And it, listen, so they're putting a plaque. Uh, somewhere I, I don't know exactly where, but they're putting a plaque on Wrigley Field uh, to commemorate the historic um, significance of of it as a historic landmark, and then also to congratulate the the Ricketts family on something. This is a separate uh, plaque. Those are two separate plaques, <laughs> yeah. by the way. It's not one plaque that says "Hey, historical monument has two plaques." Sorry, continue. How does that even work? I, like I, I <laughs> I'm going to put a plaque commemorating my family on my house yeah for it, it let's say you bought an old house right and then and then you you gutted it and you redid the whole interior and and you left the, some of the facade but then you repainted stuff and you added a bunch of new things you can kind of tell that it's the same place and then you're going to slap a plaque on the outside to be like look at how i preserved this old house oh first of all cool but like good for you i hope you you know i don't know if you removed a, a rib or two like marilyn manson in order to fillet yourself along with that or what good for you uh but the thing is you're doing this two weeks after it was announced that you're building a massive sports book adjacent to the not even adjacent to but attached to the building and your team is in the midst of its worst losing streak since an 0 14 run to open the season a few years back it's the the timing of it and again i know some of these things it's not like they just decided that like yesterday that they were going to do this it's just when it got announced but it's the repeated tone deafness as you mentioned of this ownership group and their and the business side of things just continues to be such and and the same thing was going on 10 years ago when they were leading into this rebuild when they would just do dumb stuff like the charles Lindbergh mural that they put on the side of wrigley field when he was actually at comiskey or you know they they dumped they threw away Ron Santo memorabilia and they they did they had that cake that they made up for the uh whatever it was the Museum of Natural History or whatever that nobody ate and just ended up thrown out in a dumpster this expensive cake like this we we're seeing the same things and it gets glossed over they they made a, a lot of dumb mistakes along <laughs> with well like when they were winning they were still doing dumb things from a business side. Like Comment the of the year. Oh, there you go. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> the TD and TD also, Ameritrade stands for tone deaf. <laughs> remember the stuff when they were fighting with the, the with the rooftop owners, and just just the public statements they would make. Or how about when they were battling with Tom Tunney, who I you know again maybe not a great guy, but they were throwing money behind political opponents and just publicly slamming Tom Tunney in the middle of Cubs convention. They've continued from a public standpoint public relations wise whether it's ownership or the business side which is a mouthpiece for ownership to just do the dumbest stuff at the worst times and and i i, I tweeted this out and it's I, most people agree with it but i'm like i don't care i honestly i don't mind this the changes i don't live in wrigleyville i go there to visit for games right i like yeah. the video boards i've mentioned that you and i have been to a couple of the suites there uh, I've been to the 1914 club. That stuff's really cool for an in-game experience. But, you know, don't do all that and then try to come back on the back and, and then add this massive sports book and do all these things. Don't come back on that after you've slashed payroll, after your team is in this, it has been just horrible. It's a terrible product that hasn't lived up to expectations. You're charging us tons of money for ticket prices. And then you come back and, and be like, well, look how well we've preserved Wrigley Field because yeah i mean that's and that's the thing that's what they're doing is is they're trying to sell uh wrigley field and wrigleyville as an as the experience right, they're right? Trying, not, they're not baseball this, right they're doing the same exact thing that everybody was worried about which is they're saying well people will show up to wrigley field regardless so let's tout that and what we've done to wrigley field never mind what we're doing with the actual product and that's that's that exactly field. what they're doing yeah they're, they're trying they're trying to you know obviously Jed Hoyer is focused on building the baseball operations, but from the Ricketts perspective, it's like they've created uh, Disneyland in uh, the, on the North side of Chicago and they want everybody to come. And if you look at their tweets, they're even doing, they're like, come experience Wrigley field. Yeah. 
<laughs> talking about the Goober holding anymore. up the ball like, ee, look at the foul ball I got. And I was like, oh, like that. That's cool, but guess what? Nobody's going to catch that at the next game because they're not going to be anybody on those seats because nobody wants to pay to watch this just hot mess that they've got going on there. Like, and I get it. You you have to do something. I totally understand. There's people in certain positions. Like, if you're a ticket sales rep, like you, you got to try to maintain your job, right? You got to try to make money. You got to do what you can. But it was so. Fu- I I, only, I watched the trailer for that and, and part of this whole Wrigley rededication. I do think it's cool. They're going to have like a team Hall of Fame. If that's an actual physical building, and and I know John Greenberg is writing it up, I haven't been able to check it out today to see if he's got anything up. That's kind of neat. The Reds have that at Great American Ballpark, and it's a very, very cool part. I, I totally am down for that. I like it. But if you look at the documentary about the 1060 Project, first of all, it looks like the most disingenuous stuff. Like, he sees Laura Ricketts saying something. I'm like, this just sounds so fake, first of all. you know, And I, and I get that, but... The guy who was their VP of development, who oversaw the entire 1060 project, Carl Rice, was fired last year as a part of their massive layoffs that they made. I'm like, you're celebrating this whole development, you're doing all this, and the guy who headed it all up got fired. I, is he going to be? I wonder. Is he going to be in the I, actual documentary? No way. How could you? Do, how could you would. have the documentary without him in it? Uh, I mean, how do you? Have, he led the whole thing. They do Cubs convention without Sammy Sosa. I mean, <laughs> this this team is very used to getting rid of people and shunning them off when they've been instrumental in the growth of the franchise. I just and, and maybe he will be, you know, and maybe this got. I mean, maybe it got filmed before he was fired, right? There's a lot of this stuff that was probably yeah, out. that's true. But he's a guy who, like, when I when I got invited up to go on the tour of the new clubhouse, he was one of them leading the tour. Uh, he was one of the primary ones, yeah. and then Theo was there and Crane Kenny. And I know when you, I think you went up. Right to see some of the new was it like uh yeah the clubs the Catalina the club and the barrel room and all that and he was one yeah. of them I believe right who was leading that as well yeah and so this guy was was very instrumental in all this and I listen I totally understand this but it, it kind of feels like uh the veteran who got hurt and then you're just gonna release him rather than than paying him anymore because you know he's not gonna play again and the same thing like hey, the 1060 project was done and the COVID thing, and they fired a bunch of people. They fired a bunch of scouts and, and other ticket reps and other people. And, you know, as a VP, he's probably making quite a bit of money. And they're like, well, we're done with the renovations. Maybe they can rehire him to help with the sports book. I don't know. Yeah. Well, uh, there's money. actually an interview uh, that I did with Carl, Carl Rice on uh, Cubs Insider YouTube page. Oh, so that's right. you, can go, you can go look at that. You can see the tours there. Uh, that I took, and then uh, also him uh, making some comments and kind of giving a rundown on how everything worked and how the renovation uh, took place. So there was, I did, yeah. Maybe I, they'll I, use our video. Yeah, <laughs> in the <laughs> documentary. That's in there. Um, but it's just, it's just funny because I, and I, I can't remember if I said this on the last show. I maybe I wrote about it somewhere. I, I don't. I don't really think, well, I, I do think they don't care what people think about what they do. And they, I mean, the business operation side and, and ownership, I, I think they, they want to act as if they care about what people think, but they don't. And, it, but here's the thing. I don't necessarily think it's like a really intentionally malicious or even, uh, you know, kind of a high and mighty thing. I, I think it's simply a matter of these folks are are only connected to the, the regular people in as much as Tom Ricketts will walk around the ballpark and glad hand people, right? I don't think they actually understand or know what people care about this outside of those same people that we talked about that are like, I love the Cubbies forever. I'll always wear my Cubby blue, even when they're, you know, and that's great. That's cool. If you're if you're that Pollyanna, you know, starry eyed fan with the rose colored glasses, that's great. But those are the people who are going up to Tom Ricketts and talking to him and, and thanking him profusely and just genuflecting before him for bringing them this title and and how he's the best thing that ever happened because there's still people that believe that. And and it's hard to argue it given the results of five years ago. I mean, it's easy to argue it, but it's it's hard to argue against that point that they brought a title, right? But. I don't think they truly understand when you're born with a silver spoon in your mouth, you don't understand. It's like he he thinks he understands what fans yeah, are like, yeah. met his wife in the bleachers, whatever. They don't get it and they don't care because they don't have to care. I'm not saying they, they say screw you people. I don't think they're actively saying that. I just think they don't give a shit. 
they're just they oblivious. Agenda and they're and they're yeah, they are completely oblivious to it. And the only attempts they make to really truly get the pulse of the fandom is is superficial at best, and is limited more to like Tom taking selfies with people and signing autographs and feeling like, well, everybody must love this because this is the Wrigley experience. That <laughs> he's I he's mingling with the peasants, you know. It's yeah. like it's like when the aristocrat comes out to the masses and and his presence alone gives them hope gives right. them a, a feeling to like people just, love famous it, people people will yeah, just yeah. Have, you know even if they hate that famous person they'll just follow oh let me get you know and and you know whatever and that's cool but it's just one of those things where and, and again i i get it i understand why people might fall into that category and why people want to believe this is all a necessary part of the process but to be like, you know, and, and, and again, I'm not, I don't really care if the sports book is there or not. I don't really care about the, the suites and things like that. But what I do care about is doing those things and then trying to pawn this off as if it's like some, some uh, uh, great effort that they went through uh, to the fans. Like this is some altruistic or philanthropic uh, adventure that they're, that they've embarked upon you know, like they're Melinda Gates or whatever, <laughs> trying to rid the world <laughs> of disease, you know, it, like, let's not, let's not celebrate yourselves as some sort of saviors while you're in the midst of it. If you're going to do it, do it and be transparent about it. Hey, own it. Yeah, just own it. Hey, we're trying to make money in this place. Like, we're trying to make this into a, a revenue generating massive project that also gives some cool amenities to the fans. Don't be like, oh, we're preserving Wrigley for the sanctity of the fans. And if that just so happens to make us some money along the way, then so be it. But, like, stop. You know, nobody's buying this line of bullshit anymore. So quit stepping in it because well, it and stinks and they, you're leaving. Didn't they, they got a rebate of uh, the construction costs because yes. Wrigley was named a historic uh site. So yes. well, how much did they get back? 100 million or something like that? It, it's a pretty big I I don't think because we'll we'll, we'll never really know um because that's going to go into their tax records. I think that they I don't I don't think they because they're private, right? So it's like what they have their tax breaks and I, I'm sure somebody could figure this out. I know based on the research that I had done and where those breaks were and I don't know if it's an annual thing, it was it was many many it was tens of millions of dollars. I think that's None of which went into the player payroll, of course, even though we were told that any surplus would go into that. But this didn't because, you know, of course, it is rebates on stuff that they already paid. And so now it's just coming, you know, but it's just funny, man. You're, you're going to celebrate getting this National Historic Landmark status, which, again, is supposed to preclude you from making major changes to it. Uh, they did have to go and get approval for those things, of course. But it's like. The, the landmark that you got approval for is not the same landmark that that represents what Wrigley Field was unless Zachary Taylor Davis actually had plans for a sports book. And that was, that was <laughs> the original plans he drew up. Like, oh, I want to put a casino on the corner. But, uh, which again, I, I want to keep reiterating this because I don't, I don't think people get it so much. Like, I am not opposed to the changes and to going through and revamping things because there's a lot of stuff they had to do they they really did. Yeah, the place was literally things. falling apart. Right. So I I get that, and, and they did they did preserve it. I am not arguing the fact that they didn't preserve it. I'm arguing with the fact that they're giving themselves a plaque to actually <laughs> commemorate their own actions. Right after, and again, it's it's the order of this stuff. Eleven game losing streak. Get approval for this massive sports book. Twelve game losing streak. Hey, we're giving ourselves a plaque. Like. <laughs> Something that just isn't right there. Like, <laughs> maybe give us a better team. That's the that's the be nice. recognition I would like. I I feel like that's a I. I think the plaque's going to end up being defaced by somebody at some point, unless it's in a very well, public I'm, area. I'm assuming it's going to be inside the ballpark. Yeah, you, I guess you got to put it so <laughs> got to put it someplace <laughs> behind like a plexiglass case. Seriously, it's going to be undercover and and protected by security. Yeah. 
Oh, well, well, they've, they've done a fine job of building a, a good minor league uh, system. You know, I was looking at uh, just to get off the Tom Ricketts topic because we could go on for there forever. I was looking at the, their, the Cubs top prospects and I, I, it's very interesting that they've got four shortstops in the top 15 prospects um, of their system. Young guys, right? I mean, you're talking about uh, Hernandez and, and Howard uh, under 20, um, Yeltsin Santana, just over 20. Um, so some really, really young guys there. But what's what does jump out at you is there's not a lot of pitchers in the top 15. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the, the one that's the highest is Braylon Marquez, which I, is he even playing yet? No, like he, won't he had, be, he won't. Yeah, be so he had an injury, right? Yes, his shoulders jacked up. So we don't even know what's happening there. So, you know, when you look forward to the future of the Cubs, I mean, obviously we've got Justin Steele and Keegan Thompson. I thought Steele looked pretty good last night, um, you know, and we'll see what Thompson looks like. I think he's going to – should be coming back soon. Um, I don't think they officially have him slotted in yet, but uh, but he should be back up within the next week or so. I think he's going to get at least one more. They want to get him to like five innings in the minors. I think he's been around four. So I, I believe they want to get him probably another – um, another start or so. I mean, at this point, it's not like it really matters, right? It's not, it's yeah. not like you got to count on him to fill in for you. So I know Jake okay. Arrieta will make another start in the majors before. He Can you believe that? <laughs> oh my God, dude, the Padres, what? Uh, that I mean, like, literally, did they even watch any of the games that he pitched in? Well, here, here's the thing I'm looking at two <laughs> things. One, how shitty is your minor league system that you can't just call somebody up to make that start? And two, Jake Arietta was so bad. How bad was he? He's so bad that a team that wants to lose no longer wanted him on the roster. And, now you've got and, the and we're still paying him. Now you've got the Cubs Padres who are third in their division, but still I think what they're they're you know they're leading the wild card. And and, and they're signing this dude to make a start in Colorado of all places. It is it is amazing. Like that. That I'm gonna watch like that. it's supposed to work the other way around. Like you're supposed to go find a shitty like you're you suck for a contender, they get rid of you, you go pitch for a shitty team over the last couple months and hope that you can show out, maybe somebody picks you up next year. Or you know, you get traded or maybe they maybe they release you because you requested it and they're like, "Yeah, cool, we'll get rid." Yeah. But like he was an abject disaster after the first month of the season. And maybe it's a matter of just He's too I well, I know part of the matter is he's too damn proud to admit the mistakes that he's made. He's always coming up with excuses. He'll never admit that he actually sucks or sucked. Cause I mean, who knows? Maybe he does have gas in the tank, right? But he keeps saying that, like, oh, if I knew it was wrong, I'd fix it. Well, what's wrong is you never actually freaking figured out that when your slider isn't any good anymore and you've lost four miles an hour on your sinker, you can't keep throwing it down in the zone because they're going to bomb you every time. You should have been throwing the sinker up in the zone more. That's what we even wrote about on our site. That's a lot of what the Cubs have been trying to do with their other guys who don't throw as hard. But no, Jake Arrieta believed it's still good to throw down in the zone. How'd that work out for you, Jake? Not going to work out well if you pipe one of those to Trevor Story. But no, I you know, I just think it's kind of funny. Maybe maybe pitching for a contender, maybe having a bigger chip on his shoulder, will uh, will get him going. But. It, the, the guy wasn't very good at the end of his time with the Cubs. He wasn't good in Philly. He wasn't good when he came back with the Cubs. We are not talking about someone who's having a down year. We're talking about someone who has been decidedly, he was still pretty good in, in 16. Uh, but obviously after 15, you know, uh, kind of kind of started to fall off. So I, I, I don't want to, I, I you know, it's not a matter of him pitching poorly. That's not what I'm upset about. It's just, I didn't really like him very much. I, I soured on him as an individual, kind of with the way he left the Cubs and things he said, even in the two years prior to that. Yeah, yeah. And and I just didn't I, I didn't like his overall attitude about stuff and coming up with, oh, you know, I had a bad game. Oh, it's my thumb. Had a bad game. Oh, I was, I was thrown up before the game. Had a bad game. Oh, you know, it's uh, just, I don't know what it is. This is, uh, you know, had a couple bad pitches here. And it's always something in the phantom. Age. Oh, well, he had the hamstring. That, it's been acting up for a while. We got to put him on the aisle for a while. Okay, sure. Yeah. yeah. I still got gas in the tank. Sure you do. Sure you do, buddy. Prove me wrong on Wednesday. We'll see. 
Yeah, we will see. Uh, well, I was, uh, <laughs> I said to you, he'll probably go and throw a no hitter now in Colorado. Um, wouldn't that just be the luck of the Cubs? But I, I don't probably. think that that's going to happen. Yeah. Somehow I doubt it, but hey, you know, you know, stranger things have happened. Maybe, maybe this was a wake up call for him and he, he actually, he'll start throwing high sinkers and, uh, and yeah, you know, he'll be reborn. So meanwhile, you know, looking at, I just was looking at some of the, the, the core of the Cubs, mainly Chris Bryant, Javi Baez and Anthony Rizzo. Um, you know, KB of course performing, he's what uh, batting over 300. He's got a few home runs. He it fits right in with San Francisco. And, but the funny thing is that like, I saw some comments from him today where he's saying, Oh, you know, it's just comfortable. Everybody kind of goes to work and does their thing, head down, kind of grind. And I'm thinking this feels good because the giants have the best record in baseball, I think, or they're close to it. Um, but let's not forget the Giants aren't consistently good. They're, you know, and so of course it feels good to Chris Bryant. He he's gonna feel really good about going to a team that's leading their division, that's dominating. Uh, who wouldn't feel good about that? And he's obviously a, an MVP caliber player. Uh, but this listen, the Giants came out of nowhere this year. I mean, and they have their ups and downs. I mean, they're 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 they win the World Series and they finish, you know terribly the next season but so. at least they win three in five years so i mean that's that's true you know versus but we'll one. see what happens this year but I'm, I'm happy for chris bryant just because he seems to be fitting in uh who knows what's going to end up happening with him there's so much speculation around all these guys meanwhile javi has been awful and he's injured uh anthony rizzo has hasn't actually been very good either outside of the first two games that he started for the yankees he's batting 185 in august and so you know it's it's I feel pretty good about the return the Cubs got on this guy. I mean, anybody that they got really was better than what they would have gotten in the end, which would have been nothing. So it's just it's interesting. But I think out of all those guys, it really feels like Chris Bryant is in the right place. I you know, both of us, I think we like Chris uh, the most, you know, his dad. We've had him on the show here a couple of times and I'm rooting for him. I'll be a Giants fan in the playoffs. So I got no problem with that. I hope they kick the shit out of the Cubs when they come back to Wrigley, to be honest. I mean, oh, Chris, going to, Chris well, is going to have like five home runs. Will, right. And and that's not that's not like, oh, it's not even a, a vindictive thing about letting go. It's just a matter of, hey, if the Cubs are going to lose, I mean, you might as well watch Chris Bryant just mash against them. I mean, what the hell, at least. And then and, and the five fans that are going to show up for that, uh, you know, hopefully are are the ones that, that were actually uh, cheering for him a little bit because I think people are starting to realize – what it was that they lost. And, and obviously, Hey, was he, he, he was inconsistent there uh, the last few years. And, and that was injury based, right? It wasn't, it wasn't just talent based, even though a lot of people mistakenly believe that, which is just beyond me. I, there's so many stupid online arguments I've gotten into with idiots who thought the guy was washed up, which is just dumb. Um, and speaking of Rizzo, I think the COVID thing hit him a lot harder than what the Yankees have let on. But um, yeah. And, and we'll, you know, we'll see which, uh, you know, Hey, get vaccinated. Uh, that probably could have helped a little bit, but, yeah, I, I mean, and the and the thing with Bryant was just like he he was, but he was always that that head down, quiet guy. That's all he ever really wanted. Like, hey, I'm gonna go home and play some board games with my family, and that's it. You know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna buy a yacht. I'm not gonna uh, flaunt this stuff. I'll do some ads when you know when I got this deal with Red Bull, and I'll do some of that stuff. But outside of that, he was really quiet. And I know a lot of people took that took his comments as being like directly kind of aimed at at Javi or or somebody like that. I don't think that's really the case. I think it was. I, I think it was mostly just Bryant saying, "This is what this team is." Not like my old team was this, and this team is different. Although, the you know the Cubs did inherit a measure of rock stardom, fall you know leading up to and then following that World Series title. And I think just in general, the pressure was that was there. I think San Francisco is a different type of city. There's a different type of vibe around the giants and their sports teams and and then that team itself. And I think honestly going somewhere else and having those expectations reduced or removed and having a fan base that better appreciates you has got to just be one of the most relieving experiences that you can, that you can have. And I, I think that did him well. And I think it's unfortunate because he would have loved to have stayed in Chicago. I still firmly believe that, that he absolutely would have resigned with the Cubs had they offered anything, uh, which again they they really didn't, despite what Hoyer says, there wasn't anything formal and certainly nothing recent 
And I'm going to take Brian's word for that. I'm going to take the word of, of sources that, uh, that I have in his camp that have said the same thing for the last several years. But he's the one. When you talk about change of scenery, it's not like an automatic flip uh, switch gets flipped. But, man, you take away somebody's anxiety, you take away just the, the discomfort and some of that, and you put them in a different situation, and you surround them with overall a better team. Well, yeah, shit, they're going to do better. I mean, that's that yeah. just and it's going to feel a lot better. Yeah, and, and so, but man, it was, dude, it just it it just hit me watching him out there watching fireworks. He had his little son with him in his Giants gear and watching. I'm like, that's supposed to happen at Wrigley. That's supposed to be happening with the Cubs. They could have done that, and and that's what is difficult. Is we talk about this rebuild. Well, guess what happened with that rebuild before? Is you got these guys in there who were. Chris Bryant, and Javi Baez, and Anthony Rizzo, and others, who you brought up through your system, or, or with Rizzo, you you traded for, and he was at the he had debuted, but was still like a Triple A player, and you brought them up, and they came into their own as a part of that team. Well, you don't go out and and sign all free agents. You have to have multiple <laughs> guys like that who can form the the heart of your lineup and who can be producers at a very very high level. We're talking MVP caliber, Gold Glove caliber well, levels. And so it, that takes a lot. They're, that doesn't just is, happen is this, overnight. Is this the playbook going forward? Like the Cubs, you know, obviously what they did, they didn't resign anybody. They literally did not resign one player or extend, I Hendrix. should say. Hendricks. They, they yeah, but him. they got him on a club friendly right. deal. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's that's all they're going to be able to do. That's all. They and so so they they offered they did not offer market to anybody. Obviously, if they would have had offered market to anybody, they would have had conversations. Word would have gotten out. There would have been nothing ever really came out except these way below market offers that they made to extend players. Mm -hmm. um, and so is that the playbook? Is that so we can expect that from the Cubs? Let's say they they get lucky, which I would think at this point, you know, trying to do the same thing that you did back in, you know, 2012, 13, 14 to get to where they won the World Series with a base of talent that really was cheap at the end of the day, it, they ended up having to pay them and having to bring guys in at the, you know, like J the Jason Hayward signing was just a terrible signing. That's still weighing them down, but is that what they're going to do? It's not weighing is them that, down now. Cause they only owe, he's one of only three contracts, you know, yeah. and it, but, but is that what they're going to, so are they going to develop a team? Let's say they get good. Let's say the guys that they have in the minor league system come up and in 2023, there may be close to where 2015 Cubs were um, and they get back to the playoffs and they start winning games again. Are they going to change anything? Have they learned from what has happened with this core that now is basically everyone is gone because they just didn't have the, I mean, when you talk about, they didn't have to do what they've done to get here. I, that resonates with me. I hopefully it resonates with a lot of other people, but it's like, Will they change their ways going forward if they get these guys to the major leagues and, and will they actually try to extend them on, on, uh, you know, maybe player, I don't want to say player friendly deals necessarily, but at least something that can be palatable. They'll probably try to do it earlier. I mean, that's, that's been the thing with major league baseball over the last few years. And now we're seeing these very early extensions for players, but they're huge. Look at Fernando Tatis though. I mean, it's not like he signed well, a, and that, a tiny yeah, little and that's, deal. that's a little bit different because that is you, you're talking about a guy and, and actually all the, you know, the algorithms and things that are out there, like said he was going to be an MVP, like when he was 17 years old or something weird like that. You know, I mean, there's there's been stuff that they've tracked that. But I'm talking about like um, Ozzy Albies, you know, signed very, very early and wasn't didn't didn't Eloy Jimenez uh, do one really super early with the White Sox. And you, you've got some of these where you're getting these guys where you're buying out. All, I mean, David Bodie's a bad example, but it's it's that type of timing where you've still got two or three more years of your you got two more years on a rookie deal prior to arbitration. Then you got your arbitration year. So like we're saying, hey, uh, let's get them for uh, five years and and fifty million bucks or whatever it is. I don't know, right? But so when you sign a deal like that, out. do you do you basically preclude any of their options? Their options are gone at that point or do they do uh, they retain depends. their options I mean, there's there's different things that are in there uh, i think it depends on on how that timing works i don't know and and that could be something that changes with the cba too right there could be things because mm -hmm. i know what they want to do is is reduce because the system right now it favors so heavily economically it favors a team finding those young guys and having a bunch of rookies if they can 
And then, then it flips and it has changed, you know, to where you get such cheap labor, relatively speaking, for those first seven years, six years, seven years, depending on how you, you hold them down uh, of that deal. And then, you know, free agency is kind of a given in some of these cases, like it was with Javi and Chris Bryant, because the Cubs weren't going to pay him, but they got him cheap early. And so it's like, okay, well, do you reduce, do you, do you speed the time to which they get the arbitration? Do you reduce the number of arbitration years they have? Because then teams are going to be more willing to want to keep those guys because if you come up when you're 22 years old and that team only has control of you for four years, you know, 26 is really when you're hitting the the best yeah. of your athletic prime. So mm -hmm. they're not going to want to let you go at 26. It's entirely different if you're hitting 30 when you're at that. You know, and Jason Hayward was a rare example because he came up so young and he did hit the market at like 27 years old or whatever he was, 26, 27 years old when he hit free agency. And that's why he was able to command the deal that he was. He was coming off a couple of really good seasons. But um, so, I mean, I, I think we're going to see them try to lock, whether it's Brennan Davis, right? Um, you know, certainly position players are much, uh, and, and to go back again to your other question uh, about the, how they're going to do it. Well, who are the guys that you mentioned and who are the guys who are already coming up in, in the rotation? Uh, people can maybe debate. Alzali, I think he's going to be fine long term. I think he's just struggling through some things. But if we look at Alzali and and Steele and Thompson, hopefully Marquez, um, Alexander Vizcaino is another intriguing possibility. Um, Killian, who they got from uh, from the Giants in the in the Bryant deal, I really like him. Um, uh, Wicks, you know uh, Jordan Wicks, who they just drafted number one lefty. So now, but those are the guys we're talking about. Those are the guys who could move quickly, who could be a part of the big league staff. And then you've got guys like Ben Leeper and and um, Ethan Roberts, and uh, we've seen you know Manny Rodriguez is already up there, and I think Scott Efros. We've had him on the show a couple times. That dude has been nails. And if you're telling me right now, I guarantee you Scott Efros could do better than Dan Winkler out of that out of that bullpen. <laughs> uh, if you're looking Good for the Dan. kind of middle relief guy who can give you a couple innings of work, he's a side armor. You know, does well against guys from both sides. Really good ground. Any, anyway, so now all of a sudden we're talking about a whole bunch of pitchers. Well, what was the problem with the rebuild that last time and the way they built that up? They had a whole bunch of young position players who were cheap and they had to pay for pitching and they never developed any pitching and they couldn't back any of that up. Now, though, not only do they have a lot of pitchers who are ready to come up, they've got a couple of guys at the uh, position player level. So their their pitchers are not – there's or the, the pitchers, there's a ton of depth and a nice string of players down the line. The position players, they don't have much. They don't have the elite pipeline like what we saw before, but it's a long tail. And so you can start bringing some of those guys up. So I think what they're going to try to do then is before they brought up the position players, they were to pay a ton of money toward pitchers. And then and then they got imbalanced. I think now what you're seeing is they've got a bunch of cheap pitchers that they can come up and fill up that staff with. Maybe you supplement with another starter, but then you go out there and you get maybe, and this is a maybe, is it a Carlos Correa? Do they, do they go spend some money on a guy like that? Or somebody else, uh, a, a Corey Seager, do you go out and find a guy like that who you're going to pay a bunch of money to, but he's the guy who comes in and believes, hey, we can do this, we can get this going, and now we supplement around him with a few star players who are coming up from our minors, and we have cheap pitchers, and then we can add a little bit. I, I just think they flip it that way, so it'll be interesting. Yeah, I mean, what's going to, yeah, I mean, you mentioned the depth of the pitchers, uh, as, but as I was pointing out earlier, you know, they, they, do, there's not really many pitchers in the, the top 15, uh, prospects. And so it's like, are you going to have to go out and sign, you know, a, 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 a number one, number two pitcher? Do you, do, is there a number one in the Cubs system? Marquez could be if he's healthy. I mean, but he's, he's such a question mark right now. I mean, right. he, I, I'd say be, before last year, you know, it kind of felt like that. And then like, you know, the way they brought him in just for that one game is like the last game of the season just w really weird. And then his COVID uh, entry was all weird. And now he's this season and now he's now he's injured. And so, no, I mean, you, you can't bank on, although, you know, again, there, there is no such thing as a pitching prospect, right? If you, if you look at it that way, a perfect pitching prospect, uh, certainly uh, pitching is such a crap shoot. I mean, are there some guys, will they have to go out and maybe spend, but they, they will not have to go out and go you Darvish and then Tyler Chatwood. And then you've got to spend on a bunch of other, like I think the bullpen could be made up almost exclusively of homegrown guys and still be pretty free yeah. solid. Cause then, then you got Rowan yeah. Wick, right? He just came back. So I, you know, again, and that that's not much because relievers aren't traditionally very expensive, but if you talk about, Hey, we're not paying $16 million to a reliever. And I hate that. Like, I'm not trying to make this out to like, Oh, they got to spend very little money. 
But what I am saying is, you know, you can afford to maybe go out and find, maybe he's not that ace type yet, but you, you go out and get another number two type, or maybe you luck into a number one guy, you spend some money there, and then you get like one big name free agent signing who you feel like can bat in the middle of your order and be there for five or six or seven years. And then you're able to kind of bring some, because the other thing is, that's at least that at least makes you look like you're trying to compete, whether you actually will or not. But you're spending <laughs> some money, and you have a big name back in there, and then you bring up a Brennan Davis, right? Whether it's at the start of next year or part way through next year, now you've got another piece of that, and and you know maybe Miguel Amaya is ready to start, depending on what they do with with Wilson Contreras there too. But you get a Michael Hermosillo, who's maybe not a full time piece, but been playing really well. He comes up. That's something new. You get an Alfonso Rivas. Right again, he can't replace Rizzo, but he's an on base machine, pretty solid guy. So now you start bringing these guys along, and at least you have some pieces that look like they know what they're doing, and it shows people that, like, yeah, okay, we've got a pipeline going. And then you hit 23, and maybe that changes a little bit, and some more of those guys come up, and you have, you know, whether it be, I think, Pete Crow Armstrong's probably another couple years, he's probably 24. Um, you know, I don't know, does Bryce Ball keep mashing? Who knows? Does Alexander Canario, does he keep hitting like he's been hitting uh, and, and knocking the cover off of everything? I don't know, but I, I do think they're going to they're gonna trend more heavily toward trying to develop that pitching that they never have and then pay for some hitters because that, if you go out, and, and here's, I guess, my, my final thought on this is that, as you mentioned earlier, right, their regression models didn't quite work out the way we thought because none of those guys actually – I shouldn't say none of them. Bryant was one of the few that actually did make some changes in there. But for the most part, what you had in 2015 was the same thing that you had. They peaked in 2016. And then as a group, the hitters never really completely came together. You cannot guarantee. You look at a lot of these prospects. You can't guarantee you're going to work the swing and miss. Like Canario is one of them. Big swing and miss. What we saw with their moves, whether it be Nick Madrigal or Crow Armstrong or some of these other ones, even Dykeman was a really big on-base guy, and who knows what happens there. They have trended way more toward the contact side of things. You don't know what that prospect is going to be, and you can't guarantee that in three or four or five years he's even going to be in the majors, let alone improving at the major league level. But if you go get a Corey Seager or a Correa or somebody like that who you know pretty much what you're going to be able to expect for the next four or five years, you can at least plug that guy in the lineup, and now you can work around him and I think that's something that they're going to try to look to do is, is to – I know people are, like, gun-shy on Hayward, but we're talking about a different profile uh, with some of these other guys that they could go after. So or a Trevor Story, I mean, who knows? Um, so, so you think I there's think a chance the Cubs are buyers uh, in the offseason? There's a chance. I don't, I don't, like – I'm not sitting here going, like, they're absolutely going to do that. But I do think there's a possibility, and because of what I said earlier, whether it be the hemorrhaging season ticket sales and just overall game attendance – the need to have a product on marquee that people will actually tune into. And the fact that if you're going to be featured in that field of dreams game, I mean, I don't know if, if, you know, Ricketts had to kind of promise Rob Manfred, anything uh, the Cubs are also angling to try to get an all-star game, right? Like they don't want to give that. I mean, they give it to Colorado, you know, after pulling it from Atlanta and all that. So that's a different story, but they, they need to do something because if they, if they are a terrible team next year, you talk about those biblical losses, like they're, they're, it's possible they could operate at a loss again and the sports book won't be open next year. So you've got to do something to generate activity. I'm not saying they're going to go out and, and have a $200 million payroll, but I do believe it's possible that they would go out and try to find themselves, you know, kind of a, a, a guy that they could build around because if you're, if your window opens and I've said this, that I don't think it's going to open next year, but I think 23. And if you think you can get a guy, who's going to still be solid 23, 24, 25 around whom you can kind of plug in some pieces in that roster in that, in that order. I think that's a possibility. So we'll see. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So the Cubs, uh, they play two more against Cincinnati one tonight and then one day game tomorrow. They have a day off on Thursday and then uh, a weekend home series uh, against uh, to uh, the battle for who can be the worst. <laughs> three against Kansas City and then three against the Rockies. Will be interesting to see if the Cubs can uh, can manage to win. They they've won just two games since they uh, they traded away the core back on July thirtieth, and uh, yeah. So we'll see if they can. Yeah, at some point they're bound to win another game, right? 
it, they should be able to luck themselves into a win at some point, you would think. Way, shape or form. So we'll see what happens. But, uh, hey, it'll be fun, and we're here for it. Either way, so uh, we'll be back uh, at some point next week. I'm, uh, I'll be traveling back home over the weekend, and um, yeah, we'll see what happens. Hopefully, we've got at least one win to talk about. I hope so. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Who knows? Beggars can't be choosers, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks for joining us, everybody. We'll see you next time. Joe, see you.